slice and then locked it away for
Hello. Greetings. Can you hear me? Hello. 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 I'm David. Nice to meet you, Carl. Pleasure to meet you. Um, so I, I'll control the slides, if I may. Oh, great. Uh, and I just gave you a copy in the event that something goes wrong technically. OK. Uh, uh, you want to give that a try sharing the slides now? Just to make I'll sure try sharing my slides now. Yeah. Um, now, Steve mentioned he asked about recording. I have no ob objection. I don't care either way. Uh, but first, I got to get the appropriate background for a discussion on marijuana. I'll, hang on. OK. We, we have to have the right ambiance for this. Sure. There we go. There we are. Um, let me share my screen and make sure everything's in the right spot. Right. Got to get rid of all this extra stuff. Yeah, I just did that. <laughs> um, okay, there's my tabs when I need them. Okay, good, there's, those are there. Let me get my slideshow. Um, mark by name, item type. Okay. Um, All right, why doesn't it want to show me the folder? Okay, there it is. I guess I could actually just look for the file itself instead of There we are. So there are like 58 slides. Yeah, I, I tend to go put a lot on a slide and then just sort of go over them quickly. Um, I'm not, I'm committed to the 35 minutes, which is fine. Okay. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I won't read the, the whole Megilla as it were, uh, poor him coming up. Um, so um, we'll do that on poor him. Uh, Recreational. All right. It doesn't start till eight fifteen. I've got to get this off to the side so I can open up my deck on the proper. Yeah, it's a little tricky, isn't it? It keeps wanting to open it up on the side. I guess I could just switch my. Um, which which one I'm looking at. I mean, that's easy enough. Um, share screen. You've disabled my screen sharing. That's the problem. Okay. Uh, uh, one participant can share at a time. I have that enabled. Okay. Well, if you can enable me for the moment, I'll just make sure mine comes up. Yeah, I think it is enabled. The green thing. Do you have the green? Right. All right. I see it. Yep. I see it. 
Um, got it. Keeps wanting to cover my our discuss pictures and is there a way to do it without the preview? Or you can just not do the slideshow and just scroll through the well, I could do that, but I, I can just switch my um, which slide I'm doing. Okay. Which, which screen I'm looking at. It, it keeps saying host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. Um, try, try that, try that now. There we go. You okay, should that looks good. Now. That looks good. Okay, good. Excellent. All right, I'm going to put this. Well, you're going to take over the screen sharing first, and then you'll give it to me. Okay. Uh, I don't need to share. Um, okay. So you you can we can just leave that up uh, if you want. Or... Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna take a, um, let me just make sure I can go through it. Yep, I can go through. That looks good. Very good. So, perfect. All right. Steve's gonna come on shortly, I take it. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay. I gotta, I gotta put my cats into another room. Otherwise, that, that's all we will see is my cats. They, they love they love the keyboard they, they just, <laughs> I guess it's warm they they just curl up on it okay hello hello Steve I am all set with Carl he's got his slides up he's sharing. Yes. So and, uh, um, he's fine with recording. Carl will be on in a moment. He is one of the leading physicians in America, if not in the world, related to marijuana and drug abuse. Wow. Uh, so um, I'll introduce him very briefly. He said he'll keep his talk to 35 minutes. We went over a couple of questions that I will ask him, and then you can monitor the chat uh, in terms of non political questions. Okay. Like we don't want so, to hear things about laws or um, uh, should it be legal and etc. But you know the question really becomes um, for parents. And he said you could uh, tape this and you could we could distribute it to see how it tur turns out. But he said, for example, uh, if you asked your son if he was using marijuana or you knew he was using it, what would you say if he said yes? if it was legal or not legal, when in fact it's only legal at age 21. And if he asked you if you're using it, would you tell the truth? Okay. I mean, those are questions, you know, if, um, if people don't have questions, then just ask questions to be somewhat provocative. Sounds good. So uh, why am I introducing Gary Smith? Why is there a whole paragraph of introduction? You don't need to introduce Gary Smith. You just say who Gary Smith is, uh, that's all. Don't introduce Gary Smith. Okay. All, all we're going to say is Gary Smith is the um, thing I wrote to you is the, um, this is part of the Imagine Life program okay. um, that we're concerned with addiction, suicide, and mental illness. Gary is the head of the foundation and we want to thank him for his leadership, period. Okay. That's it. 
You don't need to make these long speeches. Right. David, I sent you some highlighted questions. If you I did, I saw it. If you need to prime the pump. I did. And uh, David is on the phone and he is going to screen the uh, what's going to happen is you'll give your talk. I wrote down a couple of questions as we went over with the screen and then David will take questions from the audience. Very good. And if not, he and I will come up with some uh, other questions. Uh, I'm sure we can come up with something. Yes. So uh, there are 20,000 members of the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. It's the largest Jewish club in the world. Wow. So um, hopefully once, uh, for those who are not on tonight, uh, we will try with David's permission, uh, distribute this to our members uh, to, because we have a foundation uh, which we created called Imagine Life Before uh -huh. It's Too Late for Suicide, Addiction and Mental Health. And this fits right into it. All right. I like your background. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I'll get, I'll change mine too. So people are starting to go into the waiting room. I can admit them at any point. Uh, yeah, just admit them at 810 maybe. Do okay. you have anything else you'd like to go over with Dr. Auerbach? No, no. Nope. Thank you for doing this, David. Sure. Carl, if you'd like to follow up, there's, um, there's a little publication that we have. Um, I think um, at least signed up, there are about 6,800 people on wow. our, our little booklet. And if you want to summarize the highlights of this, then it could be more widely distributed. Okay, I, I can put a, you know, can do a some sort of a- Just summary. one page. Yeah. Um, Trying to get my full screen here, but I guess I can't. That's all right. I've got a, a view that, oh, here it is. Now, right now you don't show recording. Um, I think it is on the top left. I'm seeing a red recording. Okay, well, if you, if you believe it is, I'll, I'll trust you. Uh, I, I don't have control of that, which is fine. Right. And we're going to start at 8.15 and we'll get in promptly at 9.15. Very good. I've got a timer set for 35 minutes of my because time. Basically, we have, the, we have the patience of someone who has done five different Zooms today. <laughs> this, you're talking about me. I, I started the morning with a, a telemedicine contact and had several more meetings through the day. So I too have five, five. It's just the, the biggest problem is trying to keep it up to date, not even getting the people on the phone and the technical aspect, but just trying to remember everything you must do. Yeah. So we've been doing these webinars, some of the webinars, Carl, um, there's one on sports affinity that they have, which anybody could join. They have 1900 participants. Wow. So that's pretty good. That's very impressive. Yeah. And there are others on genealogy, financial, they're going to start one on photography, cooking, um, and other issues. And, and it's supported on Zoom, okay, with those numbers? Um, yeah. Yes. Sometimes yeah. we break out into groups. Right. We, we're going to be doing, as Steve knows, we'll be doing the AOHC um, on Zoom, and we'll be doing our fall conference on Zoom. Yes. Well, you know, it's interesting that for the synagogues, I don't know about all the churches, but that Park Avenue Synagogue, which is in New York, gets people from last week from China and Australia um, 
people from basically all over the world who otherwise yeah. would not participate, um, yeah, let alone never attend. It is uh, one of the, um, I, I hesitate to call it a bright side of the pandemic, but the ability to, the, we are forced to provide um, intellectual content remotely and it does open the door to many more people attending things that they wouldn't have otherwise. We're going to do another webinar actually as part of the New York, as part of NIOMA, New York Occupational, with Akron and Warren Silverman. Uh, we're going to do one on COVID sitting down at your desk and looking at a Zoom computer and the ergonomic um, <laughs> risks which actually ACOM has already basically came out in support of a national webinar. Yeah. And what about being too close to your refrigerator? Uh, well, you know, there's a, we all, we definitely, if you want to do a, um, I don't know how many people will attend, but clearly uh, obesity, because those people who are obese are probably one of the classes of people who are at higher risk for COVID. Right, right. And well, I, would, I, I just did a webinar. Can, I'm going to admit week. everybody at this point. Okay. okay, let them in. Let them in. Steve, I made you co-chair so you could admit people. Uh, you know. Hi, Jay. Hi, Jay. Hi, Hi Steve. Hey, Al. So we're going. Hi, how are you? Um, we're going to have this um, of taped uh, audio visual, and then we're going to be able to uh, subsequently distribute it to our members. See how many people. Well, it's not about the discipline, it's about recreation. Right. How many people ended up registering? Do you, do you know? About four, 50. Michael Lieberman. How about that? Don't let you know. Gosh. Bye. Bye. Oh, no, 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 no. Hi. Hi. There we go. Hi, everybody. Myron. Myron. Okay. Norman. Hello, Al. Al's good. Good evening. Hey, Jay. Thank, you. Thank you for coming on. Forest is one not. or two. Forest is two R's, right? I'm sorry? Forest is two R's. One R. One oh. R. I had it right. All right. Unless you're Forrest Gump. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thought I had it wrong. I was making an on-the-fly uh, correction, but that's all right. 
Thank you so much for doing this, Dr. Arbach. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you, Hal. Thank you. For organizing this through your synagogue. We appreciate it. Thank you. Everybody wants to know if they're getting free samples when they're done with the meeting. <laughs> do you know do you know that in Michigan in some of in some of the communities they're giving what they call pot for shots if you if you Oh I saw that. Yes, yes. Yeah, get a COVID shot, take a well, actually, they were doing it with alcohol, too, I think. They were doing shots of liquor, as well as shots of, uh, or, 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 or getting, or getting, or getting a reefer, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Keep that in mind when uh, we have the questions. Um, David Singer is going to exclude all such questions, and he's going to keep the talk medical, because we're going to actually, uh, because very important, we're going to distribute this to our members. Okay. Uh, and therefore, we want to, we're going to keep it purely medical. Otherwise, David, with his um, expert um, uh, computer skills, will have to start editing. I'll behave, Dr. Steve. Well, we'll have to see about getting some uh, marijuana hamatashin. <laughs> Actually, that's very interesting. <laughs> hey, Jay. Hey, Joe, hey. what do you think? <laughs> How are you, Stephen? Nice to see you. Likewise, yes. thank you. Carrie? I'm sure this, I'm sure yeah. this woman passion marijuana, especially with those prunes. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so we make woman passion with the eight sixteen. Why not do it with, with, with marijuana? Excuse me. Somebody somebody said that um, they were going to keep it all medical, but I thought that the point of this was um, recreational use. This this conversation. So, so I'm going to keep it to call I'm, it to gonna, I'm going to avoid offering any political opinion. Uh, you, you basically cannot talk about marijuana without touching on some of the medic uh, some of the political aspects but I'm not going to offer any opinion one way or the other. Perfect. At least not overtly. I may, I may hint. <laughs> so it's 8.16. We'll start at 8.17. And David, you can start then. OK. Okay. Warren's going, Warren's going to introduce you, Steve. Okay, so let's, uh, David will start. Okay, okay if go. you can admit people while I'm uh, doing the introduction, Steve, that would be great. Uh, how do I admit people? You're seeing these messages on your screen saying somebody wants to come in. So it says two people enter the room. Yes. So I press view. You press admit. I, I just did it. Okay, fine. Okay. okay. Fine. Okay, very good. So um, uh, hello and welcome to uh, Marijuana for Recreational Use, What Now? webinar presented by the uh, Forest Hills Jewish, uh, Jewish Center and uh, the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. Um, FJMC is the parent organization of over 200 conservative men's club organizations in the world. FJMC has presented over 150 webinars since the pandemic began. We work hard to provide value to our members and to the Jewish community in general. In general. For example, FJMC is a grassroots organization where one member can take an idea and turn it into an international program. At work and in other organizations, there are hierarchies and layers of bureaucracy, but in FJMC, everyone's voice counts. Each one of us can make a difference. I'm uh, David Singer. I'll be hosting uh, tonight. I'll be putting everybody on mute and I'll monitor the, the chat for non-political questions. The presentation will be 35 minutes followed by questions. And then um, uh, we will conclude at uh, 9.15. If you're enjoying this, uh, this and other webinars, uh, we would uh, 
Uh, and like to support us, uh, I'll be posting a link to donate uh, to the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs in the chat. And if you select in honor of and select affinity groups, that will make sure the affinity group gets credit. So I did want to mention Gary Smith, who is the chairman of the FJMC Foundation of Jewish Life and co-chair of the mental health wellness initiative called Imagine Life. This is a program that reaches out to synagogues and men's clubs around the country to provide unique and creative discussions associated with substance abuse, addiction, anxiety, depression, and suicide. And tonight's talk fits right in with that model of uh, prevention, education, and awareness of mental health in our society. The most recent discussion group was led by Gary, uh, Rabbis Coping with COVID. I would like to thank uh, Hal uh, Berkowitz of Forest Hills uh, Jewish Center for helping uh, to coordinate and sponsor this event. And I would like to introduce uh, uh, Steve Mandel, Dr. Steve Mandel. He's a clinical professor of neurology at Hofstra Norwell. He's the vice president of outreach and engagement at uh, New York Metro, Metro FJMC. He's a member of Park Synagogue in Sutton Place Synagogue in New York City. He's the author of three books and 250 articles. He is an ambassador of the American Medical Association. Steve, take it away. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carl Auerbach. Dr. Auerbach is an occupational medical physician for more They're doing the introduction. years. He is the past president of the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. He is also a medical review officer. He is one of the leading physicians in the United States. He is also a physician for fitness for duty for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for drug testing. The American College of Occupational Environmental Medicine is a scientific organization responsible for proposing the up-to-date scientific knowledge to keep workers and employees safe in the workplace. Especially at the time of COVID-19, the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine plays an important role. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Auerbach. He will be speaking for approximately 35 minutes. I will then have a brief five to eight minute dialogue, following which time David Singer will take questions from the chat. So everyone will be on mute at this point. And please let's welcome and thank Dr. Auerbach for being with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, my pleasure. So uh, you should be seeing on your screen a, a monograph put out by the National Academy of Science, the health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids. This is a 2017 document. This being close to Purim, uh, this is the whole Megillah. Uh, I'm not gonna go through it all, uh, nor will I have uh, brown, you know, uh, marijuana commentation available for any of us. So, um, in any case, um, the topic of marijuana in recreation is one that is really coming to the fore in the last couple of years. Um, there's my information. If you need it, um, I'll make it available. This is my own opinion, not that of ACOM, its components or any other organization or my employer. Uh, as a disclosure, I do own a small number of stocks in a marijuana sensor. I'm sorry, doctor, we're not seeing anything. On You're your not screen. seeing the screen? No, no, sir. Okay, let's see. Um, you have but, to make the doctor a co-host in order for him to share his screen. He's not yet a co-host. Do you see that now? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir, we see that now. Thank you okay. very much. So uh, I won't go over the, the joke about the whole Megilla, but it's uh, a very useful document, um, both the religious one and the uh, marijuana one. I, I have no role in this company for uh, sensor technology. 
Um, I'm going to review history of marijuana, current status of use, illegal and legal. Um, I want you to understand the difference between marijuana and CBD, understand the effects of marijuana, gain insight into the impact on driving and the workplace, and to understand vaping and the risks of it. Um, so cannabis is a broad term that describes a, that a, products from a, the cannabis salvia plant. Hemp is one of them, um, but there are products with psychoactive or medicinal actions. Cannabinoids is the active component found in it, one of which is THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, and cannabidiol, CBD. Um, and marijuana is a part high in THC. That's the intoxicating part. It's been used for 10,000 or more years throughout Europe and East Asia. It might have started out as food, but it quickly became obvious that it had psychoactive properties. It's used in fiber and rope and very much in the American colonies uh, for many years. Um, it has a history of issues. It's been banned in various places. Colonial powers in the New World banned it, especially for slaves. They felt that they were having too much fun, I guess. In 1800s, it was banned in various countries. And in the US, DC restricted it in 1906. And then this was sort of codified in the marijuana, and that's the correct spelling. That's how they spelled it, Tax Act, which prohibited production of cannabis, including production of hemp, despite its value for a variety of products. Um, in the early 20s, um, in the mid 20th century onward, certain groups, um, immigrants and musicians and um, people from Mexico brought it with them. It had a lot of racial overtones to its use or prohibit use. And it, it was instrumental in the development of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which has become the DEA. At pre-World War II and in the 1960s, it spread to uh, younger people. And I'm gonna see if I can quickly, without having to um, spend too much time, show you a brief clip from something called Reefer Madness. Um, and I probably have lost it. Well, if I, I'm sorry, I've lost it. Um, and if I can find it in the next 10 seconds, I'll, um, I won't be able to show it to you. But the bottom line is that it um, was a film put out in 1936 that described marijuana users as being manic. And um, it um, really was a very negative kind of thing. Um, there's a reference to it. There's also been some additional books on the topic, uh, understanding the racial origins of the prohibitions. Now, uh, medicine use has been present since the 1830s. In fact, back then it was used for vir virtually everything. Uh, you know, and history repeats itself because now it's being claimed that it's good for virtually everything. Um, it was outlawed in various places. California was early in it in 1907. And ironically, California was one of the first to bring it back as uh, a medicinal use. Um, there was some use in the 30s onward uh, for glaucoma and cancer related uh, appetite problems. Um, and there are legal medications that are basically marijuana uh, in chemical composition, but everybody who tries them says it doesn't work as well as things that are smoked. Uh, now, medically in 1996, California reversed itself and passed what's called the Compassionate Use Act for me medical uses. And other programs have developed varying degrees of programs since. Right now, um, all but eight of the 51 jurisdictions have some kind of a medicinal program. Um, of those, however, seven 
uh, additional ones are CBD oil. And there's this great map. Um, I'm going to see if I can show you this one. Um, uh, again, I, I don't want to hold us up. So um, let me quickly pull it up. I had them all set up and then, of course, I erased it. Um, but what you'll see is that um, the Midwest states have been uh, rather reluctant to approve it. It's been very much uh, common in California where it began and then um, it um, spread to the East Coast and um, it became um, much more useful. So this is a very nice map. It shows that New York it's, um, has mixed legal status, medicinal exists, it's been decriminalized. If you're gonna shoot over to New Jersey, um, it's fully legal. Uh, in, a, in theory, they only just now passed enabling legislation um, and so on. So, you know, there, these are the states, the South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Idaho, uh, what is that, Wyoming, I believe, and uh, Nebraska is notoriously against it. So um, the... Um, point is that um, it is becoming more and more common to um, find that uh, marijuana is available. Now, Oregon decriminalized it in 73, but it took them uh, decades to work out the details. Many other states, including New York, have decriminalized. In 2012, Colorado passed laws making possession of small amounts legal. Washington followed. Uh, and this basically created a recreational marijuana opportunity. Uh, DC has it now, 13 states uh, plus DC now have uh, rather fully decriminalized it um, or arranged for recreational sales. Um, However, there are some states where you can get jail time for even a very tiny possession of marijuana. Um, New York, and, and I, I promise not to give any political opinion, but I got to give you information. Um, in June 2019, a fully decriminalization bill was passed and signed into law. And this meant that you could have a, under two ounces with a small fine, um, and it um, eliminated that you had to empty your pockets to show uh, that you didn't have marijuana. And this took effect on August 30th. But this is not recreational marijuana. This is that it's a decriminalized situation and that you're not going to get jail time for it. Um, but what came along this year, um, and it was introduced uh, at the uh, governor state of the state address that the marijuana Re regulation and taxation act uh, has been introduced multiple times over the past few years and it basically uh, allows um, people 21 or older to legally purchase and possess small amounts and to cultivate plants for personal use um, I mean, we're talking six plants. Uh, I guess you're going to have to have a, a nice sunny window. Um, and they also had provisions to try to give back to communities that uh, had been negatively impacted by the war on drugs and by having uh, dispensaries and uh, production facilities in those. Um, he also... Um, just this week, this is literally this week, we re did a revised plan that would allow marijuana delivery services and um, 
reduce the criminality of providing marijuana to minors, as well as a better social equity program. And uh, it was just, I think, yesterday that uh, they um, talked about uh, reviving the hemp industry in New York. And um, that's going to actually raise a something like $300 million in taxes for New York. Now I've included New Jersey because when this talk began, it was a group in New Jersey that was interested in what was happening with legalization there. Um, this is even more current. Back in um, 2020 at the election, they approved marijuana legalization, uh, but there was no enabling legislation and they went back and forth and um, they continue to enforce it. Um, and it stalled last week. And yesterday, literally yesterday, the enabling legislation was signed. So now marijuana for recreational use is legal in New Jersey. So let me talk a little bit about marijuana versus CBD. They both come from the cannabis plant, but they within the plant are synthesized differently. And you can grow and select plants for different purposes. Uh, you can have one that's primarily fiber producing and one that's uh, quote drug. Um, the thing about these fiber producing is that it's also called hemp um, and the seed oil that comes from it can exceed 0.3% dry weight of THC. But the point is it does contain THC and that will become important as we go a little further into some of the drug testing issues. Now, um, but by and large, you're not gonna get high from um, CBD unless you drink a lot of it. Uh, now, this is the pathways. I don't know, there'll be a quiz on this after, but you can use this as a cheat sheet. But basically they, they start out commonly and then they go to uh, either tetrahydrocannabinol, THC or cannabidiol, CBD. Um, but it's pharmacologically active at some level. And if you drink enough of it or take enough of it into you, it comes in capsules and other forms, you'll get that same physiologic effect that marijuana can give. And it, if you take enough of it, it can cause a positive drug test, much to the dismay of a number of people who are subject to drug testing who did take CBD and feeling it was perfectly legal and um, recommended and sold in pharmacies. And um, e even though it's not really strictly legal in New York uh, until coming up, hopefully, in terms of the legislation, but they had positive drug tests. Um, I just want to do a quick word on synthetic marijuana, sometimes called spice or K2. These are not truly marijuana. They don't come from the plant. They, there's been identified a specific cannabinoid receptor. And of course the, um, drug industry developed drugs that activate these receptors. And when activated, they cause very potent psychological psychotrophic effects. And they're marketed on the internet. Some are sold retail, they're sold to kids. And, and this is a real problem in many ways that they're cheap and they don't get picked up on the standard drug test. And they can cause some real harmful side effects, including panic and heart problems and uh, they, they are bad actors. So, so what does marijuana do? And I'm gonna focus on um, THC, but if you take enough of the other forms and actually more impact from the synthetic forms, you're gonna get more of these. Uh, but what is important to realize is the root of admission, administration does make a difference. Um, there's you can be smoking them, you can put them on your skin, you can eat them. Um, there's many ways that they are in, ingested. You can vape them. Um, but broadly, that 
cause what has been called a high, which is a combination of relaxation and euphoria at the same time. Uh, I, I will tell you, I've never experienced it. I do not use, I have no intention, but this is what people are saying. And this is interesting that this high that a lot of users who are eligible for medical marijuana prefer to use uh, products that are not medical marijuana because they want to smoke it because of the speed at which this high hits. Uh, so smoking uh, is typically cigarette or pipes, often cause, called joints, and the bong is the device to which uh, you smoke it with. I noticed a fair amount of gray hair in the audience, so this harkens back to the 60s. Think of Cheech and Chong. Um, it quickly diffuses to the brain. It takes seconds to minutes to hit, and it lasts about 30 minutes at a peak, and then over the next few hours, it subsides. This is the classical way that marijuana has been used. Uh, vaping is another way, and vaping isn't particularly dangerous, and um, Stephen mentioned ACOM. ACOM is putting um, a lot of effort to trying to get the word out about it, vaping, and in fact, there's a uh, uh, article in our journal this month about the risks of it, but it starts with a liquid, uh, and it's electronically heated, and it vaporizes or atomizes it, and it's faster when compared to smoking, uh, and it clears quicker, but it also has materials like flavorings and the like, which have their own risk. Uh, if those of you who enjoy movie popcorn, movie popcorn turned out to be a very damaging product to uh, lungs if it had flavoring and you were making it because those substances, those flavors impact the lung and they cause some very serious problems. And there's some good evidence to suggest that people who vape, uh, be it marijuana or any of the other products that are touted as being uh, good for vaping, cause a increased risk of problem with COVID. The claim is you don't get the other products of combustion, which I think is important, but it's a trade-off. Uh, dabbing is a flash vaporization of an oil-based concentrate, and it's even stronger, according to those who use it, in terms of intoxicating. Uh, now, eating is where medicinal marijuana is currently provided. You, you can't smoke marijuana medicinally in New York legally. Um, it's provided in virtually every foodstuff. And I wasn't kidding about hematosh and um, it can be cooked into it. Uh, it has a slower onset, takes 30 minutes to hours to um, impact. It's longer lasting because it's got to be digested, but it actually has a higher risk of overdose because the user doesn't get that high and they keep eating marijuana products and then it all hits them. Uh, accidental ingestion, thinking it's a treat is another problem for kids. Now, you know, why do people use cannabis? They want to have sociable and sensitivity to stimuli that supposedly enhance, it alters perception of time. Just Sweet and fatty. All. I'm sorry? Sweet and fat, fatty food appetite is increased. It does give a relaxed feeling and it gives that rush or buzz, uh, but it's usually problematic. It decreases short-term memory, gives you a dry mouth, impairs motor skills, can cause panic attacks, paranoia, hallucinations, and if it's intoxicating, so you have impaired driving. Um, there are improved medications. I've listed them here. They are uh, limited in their use. Uh, CBD is claimed to treat everything. Now, these are the things that have been shown to, with reasonably good evidence, to be impacted by 
medicinal marijuana. Chemo induced nausea and vomiting, they are anti antiemetics. They stop you from throwing up. Chronic pain can be treated. Um, and interestingly, chronic pain was one of the last things added to the medicinal uh, rules in New York. MS spasticity, if the patient reports it themselves, they feel it's better. And, but all of these are modest in terms of what they do. Now, every, obviously everybody reacts differently and some people get great effects. I've heard testimonies from people who swear by it. Others say it doesn't do anything. Others say it's the way they get their marijuana. Um, insufficient evidence for most everything else, especially cancers um, and um, it's not clear it actually increases appetite. Um, irritable bowel is one of the things they're claiming it helps. Nothing much supports that. Um, these are the things that uh, are really not shown to be effective. Even though CBD has been touted as something for epilepsy, and there is a product now on the market uh, specifically for certain types of seizures, but there's no evidence that we can really point to that says they work in epilepsy. Um, when you measure the spasticity of MS by a doctor, you don't find the value. Uh, it's not good for spinal cord paralysis. Uh, maybe it helps Tourette's, uh, doesn't help a variety of uh, Parkinson-like problems. And even the one that for years was being supported by governmental research, in fact, the government grew it uh, for glaucoma research, there's limited evidence. But there's a problem here. And that is until very recently, you couldn't do any experimenting with marijuana or any of the products legally. So there was not a lot of research. If you put in a request for um, a project, you would get turned down. So hopefully over time, more research will develop and help us understand this better and fill in some of this. Um, TBI, traumatic brain injury, may have some better outcomes. Um, other addictions, it's been touted as helping with other addiction, but there's really no av available evidence. Uh, maybe some anxiety disorders are helped. Maybe that's part of the relaxation, um, but it doesn't help depression. Um, and it may help you sleep, um, and that may be why it helps pain, because quality of sleep is important to help relieve pain. Now, um, PTSD is not caused by it. You know, it, there was all this concern that because all of our service people overseas were using marijuana, um, that's why there's so much PTSD. No evidence to suggest that and nothing much to say if it helps schizophrenia or anything like that. Uh, it doesn't increase cancer risks except for a certain type of testicular, um, but there is some evidence that parental cannabis use during pregnancy in the woman is associated with a greater cancer risk in the offspring. Uh, this is something we're really going to have to tease out. Uh, Multi-generational studies are hard to do, especially when it's hard to do a study in the first place. Um, Stroke, heart attack, diabetes, it's just unclear. Um, there is lung effects if you're smoking it. Um, and if you quit, it's going to improve. But it's not clear it causes asthma or worsens it or causes COPD, uh, which regular tobacco cigarettes generally are associated with. Um, you know, immune it's claimed that CBD helps your immune system. Nothing much to suggest that. Um, we don't have data. You can't really draw a lot of conclusions when there's very little research. Um, but we do know that smoking cannabis by the mother during pregnancy is linked to lower birth weights. And that again is one of these multi-generational issues because uh, those are problems. 
Um, and um, we do know that recent cannabis impairs performance on various kinds of tests in the past 24 hours, which is why you know you don't want your truck driver, you don't want your um, pilot using marijuana. Um, now, I know a lot of you are concerned about use during adolescence, and it does appear that there are subsequent academic achievement problems, employment and income and social relationships and social roles are uh, negatively impact, but evidence is generally limited on this. Um, and, you know, th there's all sorts of other things. I, I'm going to just go by them, but bipolar, there may be an increased amount of mania with it. So maybe reefer madness was right after all. Um, I don't know. Um, so we wanted to talk about driving and marijuana. Prior to driving, if you use marijuana, you're gonna have a risk of being in a motor vehicle accident. It causes intoxication. And where it's used as legal, there's also increased risk of unintentional overdose, especially since much of the legal use is in the form of foods and candies and things that are attractive to kids. Um, but even though one of the classic studies was done in the post office that showed that people who tested positive for marijuana coming in to work with the post office had more injuries and more mortality, that really hasn't held up. Um, it, it's unclear whether it is impacted by it, but it is certainly not in an industry which does drug testing, it's not going to be very good for your occupational longevity because you're going to likely uh, have to get rehab. And if you don't pass your rehab process, you're going to get fired. Um, now, driving laws, there are 17 states are zero tolerance or very, very low level, 10 have absolute zero for any THC or a metabolite, um, three have THC only, four have specific limits, which is varies from two nanograms to five nanograms. And Colorado has a, what's called a reasonable infer, inference, in, inference law, where if you have THC on board and you had a problem, you're presumed to be under the influence. New York does not have a specific level, but if the police stop you and believe that you're under the influence and there is marijuana on board, that creates problems for you. Uh, now, how question was asked, did I address problem use? 22 million Americans, 12 or older, and yes, that is correct, 12 or older, identify as current users. Uh, and much of this data was pre-medical or pre-recreational uh, programs. 4.2 million of these reported symptoms that made them be considered cannabis use disorder, which is uh, overuse, can't stop, problems from it. Um, and there is data that suggests the more you use it and the earlier you start, the increased potential for developing cannabis use disorder. Um, but there's, the question is, is marijuana a gateway drug? That was sort of the premise of reefer madness back in the 30s. And there's very limited evidence that it brings you to regular smoking, probably because marijuana smokers prefer to smoke marijuana. Um, there's limited evidence in terms of other drugs, however. Um, and, but um, that if you do use cannabis and develop a substance abuse problem, you, you can find substance abuse problems and other drugs as well. Um, this is that reference I gave you the, it's 400 and some odd pages. So I don't recommend you sit down and read it unless you got plenty of time. Um, in the workplace, the issue is safety. Um, employees who test positive for marijuana, according to NIDA, which of course has a uh, incentive to um, find some of this data and does sponsor the research on it, 
uh, there are more industrial accidents with positive tests for marijuana and greater absenteeism. I don't know if this is going to hold up as we get more information, but that's what the data shows so far. Very few studies, however. Uh, drug testing, um, they're both illegal in the federal view, and but there are variations in enforcement. Uh, it's still um, a problem drug, it's prohibited. Marijuana, unlike the other drugs tested for in most uh, drug programs, stays in the system for 30 or more days. Others stay for three days. And it can come out from the fat at any time in the future. A, a sad situation I've encountered is people who decided to give it up, took up an exercise program, and it came out of their fat and they had a positive test. CBD has low level and can cause a positive drug test if you take enough of it. This is the time frame in the blood, days, in oral fluid saliva, uh, days to weeks, in the urine, weeks to months, in the hair, weeks to months, even longer if you have longer hair. Um, I talked about CBD. It shouldn't and alone do it, but if you do a a lot of it, it is going to cause um, potential positive, and MROs have been advised to be skeptical of it as an example. And a positive test for THC is a positive test, even if the claim of CBD is true. Um, it remains illegal on the federal level, and MROs, medical review officers, people who review and act as the protection between the drug test and report to the employer um, have been given guidance to call a positive if it's positive. For non-federal programs, there are company policies in some cases, and some places do, no, do not allow testing for it. New York has some, New York City has some prohibitions against testing for marijuana, except for certain classes. Vermont, you can't test for it all. Um, and um, this is the New York City. Uh, it doesn't apply for driver's license and kid childcare and so on. And if there's a contract, um, New Jersey, um, you can get fired for it. And briefly, medical assisted treatment is uses a variety of drugs, and um, these are designed to help you get off other drugs. And depends on the uh, usage as to whether they're going to cause a positive drug test or not, and whether they're prohibited. Um, they're not absolutely disqualifying anymore. They used to be. Methadone, Suboxone, several others, you couldn't use them at all. Now, depends on how you're using them. And that's my 35 minutes, um, and I'm going to... So I'm going to ask a, a few of questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So, um, so Dr. Auerbach, it used to be that marijuana was considered to be 4%, and you got marijuana, and you've got 4% marijuana. What's the concentration out in the street, and how often do you find that marijuana is tainted with substances such as PCP? Flocka so, and other drugs. So marijuana potency has gotten increased over the recent years. Uh, as I said, you can breed plant for particularly THC production. And it appears that most marijuana coming in illegally has increased in potency. The potency of marijuana in medical programs has been constant um, I must confess, I don't know the level, but it's uh, low um, and um, it's been stable and there are definite rules on its um, the level. The problem with the potency is you don't expect it to be as potent as it is and you get into trouble. And also, there's the, like many crops, they're sprayed with who knows what, which will cause a variety of problems, uh, often neurologic in nature. So, um, you know, pesticides and other 
products that are uh, sprayed. And then um, the dealers uh, spike them with other drugs to um, indeed make them a gateway drug to try to get the user hooked on other drugs. So street drugs are really problematic. And, you know, I said I wouldn't talk about politics, but recreational drugs may help that. Well, and the next question is, why can't you fake a drug test as you're an MRO officer? Um, what uh, people have used various drugs in order to, and substances over the counter, uh, but why can't you really fake a test these days? Well, th there are all sorts of products that are claimed on the internet, especially to um, help you pass a drug test. Um, most of them are fluid intake. If you take enough fluid, you can dilute out your urine enough because these are urine tests now. They will become uh, increasingly a saliva test. Uh, there may be breath tests um, and hair tests, uh, which are harder to dilute. Um, but um, you have to take an awful lot of fluid and you can become water intoxicated, which is a serious medical condition if you take enough of it. And some of them are downright toxic in and of themselves. And you, you take it and you kill your kidneys or you kill your neurologic system. So um, I would, you know, it, it, the abstaining is probably the best way the reason we have so many marijuana tests is because it sticks around so long. Uh, marijuana is the most frequently tested for substance. And if you do dilute, there are rules in place that say if it's too dilute, it's going to be challenged and uh, further testing is going to be needed or it may be declared that you try to scam the test. So they don't work. So I have one last question, and then um, I would suggest that everyone put your questions into the chat, and David will, will review them and ask Dr. Auerbach. So the last question, you go to a party, you don't smoke marijuana, and there's marijuana in the air. Your friends are smoking marijuana. How likely are you to be tested positive? Depends on how many friends you have, I guess. Uh, the... There were studies done years ago that put people in a small car or telephone booth and filled the air with marijuana smoke. And these people did not test positive. Uh, of course, these were not necessarily rigorous testing. And um, nowadays, uh, with uh, some companies, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, for example, tests down to zero, basically. So um, it is possible you're going to absorb some marijuana, but by and large, that is not a real practical problem. Uh, of course, you know, you have to choose your friends carefully. And an MRO is told, do not accept that as a a valid reason for finding a marijuana in the urine or wherever. So David, do you have a number of questions from the chat? I do, I do have a few questions. Um, can CBD cause dizziness, ataxia and fainting? In high enough doses, yes. Okay. I mean, I, I, I just am reminded um, years ago, we, we used to have um, a sort of a um, image of a older individual uh, hiding in the closet drinking cough syrup, which at the time contained alcohol. And it, you drink enough of it, you're going to get drunk. You take enough CBD, you're going to get potentially high. Okay, what's the difference between pot in the 70s and pot now? Um, Pot now, and if we're talking by pot, you mean illegal uh, marijuana, is much more potent. Um, it also tends to be pure. Um, pot years ago had a whole bunch of other things potentially mixed in. Uh, now the growers of 
marijuana have figured a way to get great crop yields. So what's the difference between marijuana that you get in the street and marijuana that you get from a dispensary? Well, marijuana from a dispensary is carefully um, monitored as to potency, whereas marijuana on the street is not. Marijuana from a dispensary is produced pure, if you will. It doesn't have um, any additives or anything adulterating it. That's not true of street marijuana. So marijuana, the physicians cannot prescribe marijuana. They could recommend marijuana. Could you right. clarify that? Yeah, federal rules, marijuana is a uh, very uh, restricted um, class of drugs. A physician cannot prescribe marijuana. Um, so what the process in New York is, you go to a physician who is taking a test, a course and a test, and is authorized to recommend marijuana, they write typically on a prescription pad, uh, a, give this person a, mar a medical marijuana card. The medical marijuana card is issued by the state. You take that to a dispensary and you can buy a limited amount of medical marijuana in edible form. Someone brought up the idea with a question I'll read here. A few years ago, Hadassah magazine in Israel um, tested marijuana and it helped with different diseases. I think that you've gone over the evidence-based medicine that has clarified the evidence or lack of evidence. Um, marijuana is in the PDR dispensary for um, Lennox Gasto, which is a particular type of seizure, Marinol, which is for uh, a um, cachexia, especially right. associated with cancer, and in HIV. But I don't believe that there is any prescribed marijuana, uh, which is in the form of Marinol and other substances that physicians themselves could prescribe these days. Well, like. Two, two points, like any other prescription, if you are prescribed a medication and the uh, indication is for A, nothing stops a physician for prescribing it for B. Uh, methadone is a perfect example. A lot of people were prescribed methadone for quote pain, but in fact, they were actually using it for uh, preventing substance abuse. Um, and similarly with Marinol, nothing stops a physician um, except ethics from prescribing it for any indication they, the physician, feel is appropriate. Now, the second part of that, if, you know, I, I went through it pretty quickly, but the evidence for any of the cannabinoids having a positive value in most of those conditions that you mentioned is pretty sparse, uh, including the, the recent uh, Epilodox, I think is the name of it, which is prescribed for certain types of seizures. There, there's very little evidence, and, and I don't want to get into politics, but a lot of these are moving along because of by popular demand, if you will. And sometimes there are no other treatments. So it's compassionate use. Uh, so that, you know, the, there's only a few indications that ma marijuana or Marinol really has been shown to be effective. Some people will use um, antihistamines, uh, they'll use um, pain medication under some circumstances when required. What's the effect when added to marijuana? Well, um, any, uh, it's a whole talk that I once gave on uh, all the medications that can impact function, such as driving or intellectual activity. And Benadryl is right up there um, and they're not regulated and a lot of drivers use them, for example. You put the two together, you have two intoxicating substances, you're asking for trouble. 
So, um, I mean, like any other combination of medications, if you're going to use more than one medication, you want to look at the uh, impacts, the negative impacts or side effects, and try to match that against another medication that might be valuable that doesn't have the same si set of side effects. So, um, yeah, they can they can cause increased problems. David, more questions? Okay. Um... Is there a comparison between alcohol as a gateway drug or tobacco as a gateway drug? Or Well, um, alcohol is probably the more serious drug abuse when compared to marijuana. Now, that may be construed as a political opinion. I do not use um, any, any marijuana, and I'll have a a cup of wine at Chavez, but um, you know, alcohol causes many more problems than does marijuana. Alcohol has a potentially life-threatening withdrawal syndrome, whereas marijuana doesn't appear to have that. Um, and um, in terms of being a gateway drug, this gets into a whole bunch of you know, sociological and psychological things that are beyond what I can speak to, but um, I think alcohol is a gateway drug as well as marijuana potentially being something that can lead in a small number of users to more problems. So could you tell okay. us um, in, um, so in the United States has been restrictions about research on marijuana. But other countries, uh, I thought I had heard that Israel had had significant studies that other countries didn't. Well, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of studies done overseas. And again, it's going to hinge on, uh, it's going to border on political. The U.S. medical profession and the FDA and so on generally don't believe them. They ignore them. I mean, just look at some of the stuff with the with the um, COVID vaccines. We wouldn't approve COVID vaccines until you know, a lot of stuff had been done in the US, whereas other countries have done some of this. Now, I, I'm not prepared to say their research is good, bad, or indifferent, but you know, um, this information that I quoted to you from this document does call upon international resources. And, you know, again, even though other countries may allow it more, there's prohibition against marijuana use worldwide. If you are a, uh, there are 2.5 million certified commercial drivers, people who drive trucks every day, what's the rule? Or are they breaking the rule? Or are they breaking the law if test positive for marijuana? Well, testing positive for marijuana in and of itself is not necessarily, quote, breaking the law. It's a violation of a policy set up by the FMCSA, the, the driver agency, that says you will not have a positive test for the following substances. So if they test positive, it's a violation. If you violate, the employer is supposed to offer you rehab and um, help you get back into the workplace. Unfortunately, not a lot of employers do that. And if you are having repeat violations, you're gonna be banned from driving. There's a, a national registry, which this all has to go to. And an employer has to check that before they can bring a driver on. And they have to have proof that this driver has gone through rehab. So before we ask like the last one or two questions, could you tell everybody what is the American College of Occupational Environmental Medicine? Who are these occupational medical doctors? And what is an MRO? What does all that mean? Because people may not know what actually you do. Okay, so in the US, Occupational medicine and environmental medicine are 
a specialty of the Board of American Board of Preventive Medicine. We study uh, work injuries, we study toxicology, we study the effects of chemicals on workers and workplaces. Um, the professional organization is the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. There are about 4,000 members these days, uh, which represents uh, probably about two thirds of uh, trained occupational medicine physicians in the US. There are a lot of physicians who say they do occupational medicine, uh, but basically they're doing treatment of injuries rather than looking into complex cases of causality and uh, toxicology and the like. The medical review officer is an entity that was set up by the federal government to deal with drug testing in the federal programs. They serve as the receiver of a drug test result that comes from a lab. So the drug test used to be urine, now it could be hair, or saliva, uh, is collected by a collector who's trained, by the way, um, under guidance from a medical review officer who's responsible for the program, but they have their own um, certifications. The lab does it, um, they test for it, and they send the result in a federal program to a medical review officer who looks at the test and says, is there a valid reason for this drug test to be positive? So for example, if a narcotic such as oxycodone shows up, does this person have a prescription for oxycodone? And if so, are they using it appropriately? In which case the test is reported as negative and there's no violation. If there's no such valid reason, then it's reported as positive. Since there's no federal use of marijuana, by definition, if you will, a positive marijuana THC, which is what's tested for, is a positive test and a violation. However, increasingly MROs are rethinking that and we'll see how that goes over time but strictly speaking it's a positive test so David, do you have one last question for dr arabak before we thank him okay somebody asked uh, whether uh in colorado since it was one of the first states to normalize pot has, has they seen a reduction in drug arrests um, yes and no. Um, they've seen um, a marked decrease in casual use drug arrests because they're not arresting them. Uh, however, um, the police are more aware of the intoxicating effect of marijuana. And if there's suspicion, they will um, call for a test for marijuana. So in the driving world, we're probably seeing more, um, but it's, it's not marked differences. We're, we're certainly um, not seeing this wholesale, and again, I'm maybe verging on politics, this wholesale arrest of certain groups of people. So um, in conclusion, I just want to thank Dr. Auerbach and the FJMC because this has been a biopsychosocial event that I think that uh, for those who expected to hear uh, politics and social activities, I think came out with more information, more knowledge for themselves and for their families and to relate to our community. So I wanted to thank you for this uh, outstanding presentation. My pleasure. Thank you. David, thank you very much. Thank for you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. I, I'm not sure how to leave. I don't see my leave button here. So goodbye, and over time, I'll get off. <laughs> You got to stop sharing, but I'll end the meeting and then you'll, it'll be done. I, I think I, oh, I thought I stopped sharing, but maybe not. Okay, there we go. Bye-bye. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.